The very first thing is that uh, welcome to our this year's first energy talk, the Great Engine of the Energy Talks, and we host uh, uh, Hakan Karan from all the way from Australia. <laughs> and he's going to talk about the, the only thing I understand is about the solar <laughs> energy application, and apparently it is the state of the art technology. And I'm very much looking forward to hear the, all these new good things about the renewables. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, first of all, it's good to be back. Uh, I'm a Bill Kent graduate. I graduated from electrical and electronics engineering in 2014. Then I did my master's in sustainable energy before uh, working two years in Istanbul on renewable energy financing. And uh, in January, I started an adventure in Australia uh, in macroalgae based uh, renewable solar fuels. Um, <coughs> I am part of uh, a research group uh, and uh, we have lots of collaborations both in the industry and academia and the government. Uh, we have around 30 national and international teams and our aim is to fast track the development of a solar bioeconomy. I should say I'm one of the uh, two engineers in the uh, group. All the other researchers are uh, you know, biology, study biology related topics like like genomes and photosynthesis and like cells. So they they don't talk about the language of uh, money. Uh, so our topics include uh, clean water with uh, microalgal uh, vessel treatment facilities, production of uh, animal feeds, uh, proteins, foods, of course, production of fuels. And we have other projects such as uh, green smart cities. So why do I study this topic? Uh, the world will reach uh, more than 10, million, 10 billion population in 2050. And most of this growth will occur in Asia and Africa with the uh, developing nations. So by 2050, we would need we would need 70% more food, 50% more fresh water, and 50% more fuel. These three things are called uh, energy, food, and water nexus. So they're, they, have, uh, they are very interlinked. For instance, if you want to produce fuel from corn, it means you are uh, taking from here and putting into here. And it also uh, consumes water, so there is a very delicate balance in balancing these needs. Of course, the other uh, problem is climate change. Uh, the uh, CO2 levels are rising, and with it, the global mean temperature. Uh, the P Paris Climate Agreement states that we have to limit the increase in global mean temperature to well below 2 degrees, and preferably between 1.5 degrees. To do that, we need to achieve zero emissions in, two, in the next 20 years. To do that, we need innovative technologies, efficient technologies and economic technologies. Uh, so this is the graph of the primary energy use in the last 50 years. So you can clearly see the problem here. Around 80% of our primary energy consists of fossil fuels, uh, oil, natural gas and coal. Only carbon-free technologies such as nuclear and hydroelectric and renewables are here. To achieve net zero emissions, this has to peak today. So next year, it has to go down. So this will be a significant challenge. Uh, to do that, uh, we need to employ uh, circular economic principles in the global economy. Uh, the, the global economy worth, uh, is worth $127 trillion. And historically, 5 to 14% of this amount belongs to the energy sector. So most, most of the money here will have to shift from fossil fuels to sustainable energy technologies. And the economy is linear. For example, uh, to produce this uh, microphone, you have to extract materials from earth, you have to extract fossil fuels, you use it and then you discard it. It sits in the landfill for decades or maybe centuries. This is not sustainable. We have to uh, switch to a, a circular economy such as what happens in the nature. In the nature, there's a tree, it grows an apple, an animal eats that apple, grows, 
ultimately dies and from its body a new tree can grow. So this is a circular approach. So we have to, uh, we have to transform our economy into a circular design. So this is a very famous uh, circular economy uh, figure from Ellen MacArthur Foundation. Uh, the, this blue part uh, is about recycling what we have, reusing what we have and maintaining what we have. Uh, but I want to uh, talk about this green part, which puts an emphasis, emphasis on green production. So this basically says, if we can produce uh, what we can from uh, organic resources, then ultimately we can decompose them and regrow them again, thus making our economy circular. So biofuels play a large role in this area. Uh, we can power this cycle uh, with solar energy. So the sun provides more than 5,000 times of our global energy demand. And uh, of the global energy demand, around 20% of it is electricity and 80% of it is fuels. So with the 20% the part can be, deal with, can be dealt with renewables, while the remaining parts can be dealt with uh, biofuels, such as from algae or other resources. But this is the most challenging part. So how does the sun, how does the sun power the Earth? The Earth has a solar interface. In terrestrial environments, it's the trees and the plants and the flowers. Uh, they convert the energy from the sun into chemical and biological energy, but in aquatic environments, it's micro and macro algae. Uh, uh, what I'll be focusing is on microalgae. These are microscopic uh, single-celled organisms, and uh, they, they can perform photosynthesis. Around 350,000 species exist, and they're responsible about 75% of uh, atmospheric oxygen in the world. So you can see how uh, impactful they are in our Earth. Um, they can be found in many different colors. You might, you might have experienced this. For example, sometimes the sea changes color from blue to turquoise to red. These happen because of uh, algae blooms. So they are very abundant uh, in global water sources. There's also macroalgae, which is seaweed, uh, but this, it will not be the topic of this uh, presentation. They always exist in the oceans? Uh, oceans, rivers, lakes. Probably we have some in our lake down there. So yeah, they are very abundant. Uh, you can even find them in the ground. So they're everywhere. I mean, you can, you can, so you can see this number. So basically they are the reason life started on Earth because uh, before there were any plants, there were microalgae in the oceans. They started uh, creating the oxygen that we breathe today. So why do we study microalgae? It's because they are very productive. <coughs> so this table uh, gives an overview of uh, biodiesel productivity of conventional crops and microalgae here. Uh, you can see that, for example, corn is a very popular biofuel uh, crop. It can produce 152 kilograms of biodiesel per hectare per year, while algae can produce around 500 times more, while using around 500 times less land. So they are really efficient in this manner. By the way, you can interrupt me anytime if you have questions. So. Same, with, same thing with the ethanol. Again, corn is a very popular ethanol crop. Al algae has the potential to grow around 100 times, uh, sorry, yeah, 100 times more ethanol per hectare. So why aren't we doing this? Why aren't we just uh, establishing uh, microalgae uh, plants? It's because they're expensive. Although in the last decade we invested around one uh, billion dollars, we still haven't achieved significant cost reductions so that they can become competitive in the market. Uh, these things you see here are photobioreactors. They are closed systems. They are one of the two main configurations of microalgae systems. Um, they can achieve very high efficiencies. You can control what goes in and what comes out. But 
they are really expensive. The other options are open ponds, which you can see here. These are, I mean, although they look huge, they are around 50 centimeters deep. Uh, these are open systems. Uh, you can scale them up easily, but they're not as uh, efficient as the as photobioreactors, and the quality you get out out of microalgae is not very high. But they are easy to scale up. For example, this one is interesting. So this is a beta carotene uh, plant in Australia. They produce, you know, the 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 molecule in, in carrots here. To, to be used in pharmaceuticals and nutraceuticals. Uh, how does this production system work? Uh, they are, this, it's roughly, uh, it can be roughly divided into four steps. The first step is growth and cultivation. First, you have to choose uh, your microalgae strain. Like I said, there are 350,000 strains in the world. So if you have to choose your strain depending on what your pr uh, product is. For example, if you want to produce biofuels, it's uh, a good idea to go with lipid-intensive strains. If you want to produce bioplastics, it's easier. It's a good idea to go with uh, carbohydrate-rich strains. And then, depending on your uh, product, you choose whether uh, open or closed systems. Uh, as a rule, if you are producing commodities, you go with open systems because they are easy to scale up and cheap, and you don't require very high-quality products. But if you go with, uh, uh, if you want to produce medicines and like pharmaceuticals, you have to go with the closed systems because you have to control what goes in and what comes out, and you need a very high quality product. The second stage is harvesting and dewatering. Uh, this is one of the most problematic steps and one of the main reasons why my algae becomes algae couldn't become competitive with uh, other uh, crops. Basically, you uh, you have to remove around 90% of the water from the system, maybe 80%. And this is a very hard task. You can use technologies such as settling, and you can let it settle. Although it is, it's not energy intensive, it takes a really long time to do this. You can use other technologies such as centrifugation. You spin, you spin the po uh, pond, you try to remove the water. This is faster, but it's very energy intensive. So. Uh, successful facilities should need, need to find a common ground to find an optimum method of dewatering this algae. I will I will show I will show you how dewatered algae looks like in the following slide. The third step is uh, cell disruption and extraction. You have to extract what you require from algae. For example, if you want to use if produce biofuels, you might have to extract lipids from it. Uh, there are several methods to do this, such as solvent extraction. They also do this in conventional crops such as soybeans. You put solvent into the uh, pond, it uh, solubilizes the lipids and then you can extract it and then use the lipid to produce biofuels. The last step is uh, refining and deciding what to do with the residues. Uh, for example, if you want to produce bio oil, uh, you, you might have to pump hydrogen into them to saturate the hydrocarbons and remove nitrogen from it because when burned they produce toxic gases. And with the residues you have, you can use it as animal feed, you can use it as fertilizers, or you can use it in a fermenter to produce biogas and produce renewable electricity. In ge general, you will get one of these five categories of products once you are done with the system. Uh, these are sample biofuel production processes. I won't give much emphasis on them. I mean, you, just, you can just see that uh, there are many methods of producing many different uh, fuel sources. You can produce hydrocarbons and methane and heat. For example, yeah, this is biodiesel, this is oil, and this is dried algae. So it's, it's hard to imagine, uh, you know, this green uh, water uh, turning into other products such as biofuels and uh, I don't know chemicals. So this is a video I took in our facility in Australia. So this is the consistency of the pond. You can see it's like seawater. And if you centrifuge it twice, you will get this. It has a like a very oceanic smell, like seafood. Uh, it's uh, like a like green paint. Then you can use this. 
paint, uh, you, can, you can use this uh, sludge to produce, for example, biodiesel, you can produce hydrogen, jet fuel, you can uh, try to produce bioplastics, you can uh, produce human food, you can produce like omega-3 oils, you can produce uh, enzymes, so it's, it's very flexible. Yeah, yeah. The costly part is transforming this into this. This is the the sludge from around three ponds. The uh, each pond is like f uh, three, four bathtubs. So you can see how much water is removed. It's just like this. So it's very resource intensive. So this is a. Short video. Now, this is obviously only on a small scale, but the principle is clear. Ben's algae really can produce a hydrogen using only sunlight, and that hydrogen is pure enough to generate energy from a fuel cell. Yeah. So, uh, you can, uh, some types of algae uh, produce hydrogen with sunlight, so you can theoretically use the sunlight to power uh, fuel cells in cars. When of course uh, this technology is currently in competition with electric cars, with the battery technology, but it will still be an important technology in the future. So I, I told you how expensive uh, macroalgae systems are. So this is, so this figure is what we call a triple bottom line. We want these systems to have an energy benefits, uh, uh, environmental benefits, and economic benefits. So this is fuel price, this is energy return per energy invested, and this, these are greenhouse gas emissions. Right now we are at here. So we can produce oil around $15 per gallon. The market price per, uh, of oil, of fossil fuel oil, is $1.2 per gallon. So it's around tenfold difference. So what's, what, we, what can we do to uh, you know, take this and bring this to the lower right side of the graph? We can try to, let's say the productivity is maximized from 14.2 grams meter square per day to 30. This would, re this would reduce the fuel price to around $9. Let's say we couple it with a renewable energy production plant like solar energy. This would take it here, uh, reducing our uh, energy needs and we can use policy approaches such as carbon taxes, corporate uh, tax rates and interest rates. If you reduce them we can lower it to here L and let's assume we are running a non-for-profit production plant and we maximize every other possible thing. Finally we can go into this green box where it can be cost competitive and uh, environmentally uh, beneficial with you know, other fuels. So, basically, to ultimately re reduce costs, we have to f do an integrated biorefinery approach. Uh, I mean, what I mean is we have to use et and then, you know. So we have, to, we have to use every single thing inside the algae. We have to use its lipids, we have to use its pigments, we have to use its waste. So we have to use everything so that we can generate lots of products uh, to lower the cost. We, we need efficient technologies, especially low energy consuming technologies, for, for example for that harvesting stage. We, we need to find better strains or engineer better strains using genetically modified organisms. And we need targeted energy policy such as uh, subsidies or beneficial tax rates for these types of plants. So that's, my, that's the topic of my PhD. I'm trying to find ways to reduce costs of these fuels. Um, we are doing a techno-economic analysis, so uh, we, we have a model. We are constantly trying to improve and test the model so that we can find ways to reduce the cost. Right now, my aim is to couple biofuel production with animal feed and protein production and maybe bioplastics in the future because they are higher value products, so from the profit you gain from them, you might be able to reduce uh, the selling costs of your fuel. So this is a snippet from our model. 
it's an Excel based model. It's it's uh, very uh, you know very detailed. Uh, this is a very recent data. Uh, we are trying to optimize uh, the location of, of microalgae plants. We are testing different locations around the world. Uh, right now, the most uh, so you can see it from this table that so this is the productivity uh, by so liters per hectares per day, and this is the internal rate of return. We ideally want, want an internal rate of return more than 10 percent. As you can see, the most profitable places we found are in India and in Brazil, which makes sense because uh, they are huge countries with probably low land costs and uh, wage costs. The most surprising thing about this table is Turkey. So it's, it's one. Although it's comparable, the, the productivity is comparable to Tunisia, uh, there's like a tenfold difference between the IRRs. This is mainly due to the, the current economic situation we're in, with the excessive uh, interest costs and you know uh, inflation. Whatever. Hopefully, it will change in the future. So uh, this is a case study for Australia. Australia is a huge country with only 25 million of population, and it consumes around 50,000 million liters of petroleum products. If you want to produce all of this petroleum <coughs> organically from algae, you need a plant area of 116 kilometers to 116 kilometers. This looks like huge, but it's only 0.2% of Australia's land area. And it will have huge employment benefits, uh, huge import savings, and 27% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions. Besides production plants, you can also use algae in your homes uh, as an insulation or like in, like in solar panels. They have a high thermal pass uh, that you can use as insulation. It can provide shade. You can even generate your own fuel and electricity from them. I mean, of course, these are very expensive right now. Maybe in the next 20 years, you know, who knows. Uh, you can also use to regrow the cities. For example, this is Singapore. If you don't have a place for trees and plants, you can attach these to buildings, you can, to green the cities, to provide oxygen. No. So, thank you. Some kind of pitfalls like that. You cannot use the solar transport, yeah. the wind. I mean, the, what is the scale that we will be able to use if it is equitable at one point? I mean, can we use 17 for 24 7? Yeah, uh, dep depending on your applications. If you want to you produce hydrogen and continue to use it, it might need sunlight. But if you want to produce like oil, uh, you can just harvest it throughout the day and then use it 24-7. Because, uh, so what is limiting about solar and wind? So for sun, it needs sunlight. For wind, it needs wind. But, I mean, for this, they are alive even after, at night as well. So they still have an embodied energy. You can think of it as, like, batteries. So they, they gather energy throughout the day. I mean, you can, for example, burn it all during the day, but you won't, you won't have anything at night. So if you... But if you can use it at night as well, because they are there. They store energy from the sunlight. Also, you mentioned that it is labor intensive I mean, the, compared to capital intensity. So where do labor get there? Uh, so this, uh, they have, for, compared to a solar plant, it's very labor intensive because uh, these are living things and they are difficult to maintain, like, like farms. But you also have complex mechanical, uh, you know, processes such as centrifugation, and uh, you know, they have co complex needs such as fertilizers. So you have to take care of them 24/7. That's why, and you also need qualified personnel to deal with these microorganisms. Biofuels, big environmental, would be welcome. Uh, 
but the others, uh, if this is going to replace those products, right, uh, given the cost of everything. Yeah. Uh, so uh, in your investment rate of return, do you calculate the labor replacement? So this one? Works, yeah, which, which sectors will lose labor? Oh. You see my point? Yeah. Uh, so your employment, I mean, this may create some unemployment. Versus this question, how much employment would this create? And all that maybe technical process, I assume, requires uh, high educated yeah. uh, or high skilled labor force. So abundant labor force in the world is not educated and we need employment. Yeah. I mean, for example, uh, let's say Turkey, we don't have any fossil fuel resources. Mm -hmm. So if you produce them, then we would not be you know, uh, hurting any other industry. Yeah. We would be hurting other countries maybe, mm -hmm. but not, not ourselves. But of course, I mean, you, you will need educated people, but it's, you, can, you can teach people how to operate this plant. It's like, it's like a farm, yeah. basically. But it's a very weird farm. Uh, and if, if you produce other things, uh, for example, uh, bioplastics, I mean, right now, uh, mo most of the world is trying to switch from conventional plastics to bioplastics, especially bio biodegradable plastics. So it's, it's the way the market is going. Uh, and most plastics are produced from fossil fuels anyway. So if you produce both energy and, uh, for example, plastics, then you would be relying less on fossil fuel production. Of course, for example, for the US or for other you know, uh, fossil fuel rich countries, there might be some debate. But we have to reduce our emissions. So this is all. We might be hurting some you know, industries, but this, is, this should be our first priority. And uh, by the way, the IRRs are, uh, I have shown are only for biofuels, especially for bio oil. If you include these, the profitability increases a lot especially pharmaceuticals, uh, it's like omega-3 oils. So they have, uh, you know, there's a really, the demand is high and you can sell it uh, for a higher product. So in your model, how did you decide which uh, set of products are going to produce? Uh, right you now. So optimum mix of those for the yeah. So I mean that's my PhD basically. So right now, right now the model produces only fuel. I'm trying to improve the model, optimize and try to implement other modules such as you know protein production, you know bioplastics production. We'll see. I'm you know I'm in my first year right now. We'll see how it goes. And I mean I should say I don't know anything about biology before you know starting here. So it was just a like you know I I found an opportunity. I went there. You know, so it's been weird for me as well. Sure. So, in calculating the investment rate of return, your finance is local, domestic, international? Sorry? Like finance, right? Yeah. Finance, no, uh, I mean, each, each for its own. Each, I mean, if it's in Amsterdam, mm -hmm. everything is in Amsterdam. So, okay. everything is in the Netherlands. If it's Turkey, financing is in Turkey, you know, okay. taxation. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for coming up and uh, hope to see you on the coming seminars that we talk. Thank you for coming here.